Neuroeconomics combines behavioral economics uh, and uh, neuroimaging to study the way that people make uh, decisions. We use uh, functional magnetic uh, resonance imaging, which you can think of as uh, time-lapse photography of the brain's activity uh, while people are making these choices. And uh, I was originally uh, reading neuroeconomics papers for fun, which is a totally normal thing for people to do. Um, and, and as I was reading, I was struck by, uh, you know, they were all about things like how do we allocate scarce resources, uh, how do we make trade-offs between short-term benefits and long-term gains, uh, or between moral and economic values. And these were all things that were readily applicable to uh, environmental challenges that we face today. I looked around, this was in 2009, and no one uh, really seemed to be looking at uh, environmental issues through this lens of neuroeconomics, uh, and I wondered why. And so uh, that led me to applying to IPER uh, with that pre premise, EIPER. And, uh, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> and uh, so this is the dissertation overview. Um, basically, we'll be talking about two different uh, studies here today. Uh, the first one uh, is on environmental valuation, how people uh, value uh, natural resources and public goods, uh, and then moving to private goods, how people uh, make decisions around uh, energy efficient uh, purchases. We're going to be focusing mainly on the uh, neuroimaging studies that form two chapters uh, of the work. So a lot of you have probably seen uh, by now these things that look rather like heat maps of uh, the brain's activity. What we're actually looking at is the, uh, called the bold signal, or how the brain shuttles around blood and oxygen in order to meet the uh, demands of, uh, energy demands of brain activity. Uh, and we're looking at contrasts uh, for the given factors of interest. So say we we're looking at uh, how the brain behaves when price increases, then you'd be looking at correlated brain activity uh, as price rises. And you can see down at the bottom there, uh, you know, z-scores, the so statistical significance increases as you get towards a brighter and brighter uh, yellow on these maps. We do this uh, scanning in the basement of the psych building uh, down at the uh, CNI. And so someone lies down in that table uh, by the, the MRI uh, machine that you see on the left, and they put on a headset, and they see a computer program reflected uh, in front of them, and they interact with the computer program that we've built uh, to make uh, decisions, and we record their responses and record their uh, brain activity uh, while they're doing that. So why use neuroeconomics? What do we actually gain from this window into the mind? So this gives us a really uh, good way of seeing how people systematically diverge from what economists think of as rational actor uh, behavior. Uh, there's all these ways that we do predictably irrational things that are uh, well characterized, but maybe the underlying mechanisms of why we do certain things uh, that are systematically irrational is less well understood. And we can understand when these divergences happen, uh, what are the conditions that might predispose people to certain courses of action. And maybe one of the most interesting things uh, that we can look at is assessing differences in the way that different types of people uh, parse information, uh, looking at things like their environmental attitudes or uh, different aspects of their cognition, like how good they are at math. And so we're going to be breaking down people along those lines uh, as well. There's two uh, main ways that we can kind of break apart the uh, brain imaging data. One uh, way that a lot of people uh, do for these studies is essentially correlational. So you're looking at what brain activity is associated uh, with the types of information that you're presenting to people and what changes uh, when you vary those attributes of the information that you're presenting to people. And we call this an input model. We're looking at how the stimuli uh, affect uh, the brain activity. Uh, but we also like to move one step forward uh, into prediction and trying to predict behavior using people's uh, brain activity. So we're looking at what activity is significantly influencing uh, that decision making. And the most interesting areas to look at, especially when we're talking about environmental behavior change, is studying this overlap. So what are areas which not only respond to the types of input that we're feeding people uh, and can be changed by framing effects and that sort of thing, uh, but also those same areas uh, being predictive 
uh, of choice. And these are the target areas that we really want to delve into. It's been really uh, exciting just in the last few years. There have been a lot of strides forward in using brain activity to predict not just the behavior of the people that are in your study sample, but at the population level. Uh, and this has been done in everything from music sales, the efficacy of anti-smoking ad campaigns, and the success of, of microloan funding. Uh, and the really cool thing is that this uh, often can outperform the self-report of the people that are in those uh, studies. Uh, so what do I mean by this? It's, I'll give you the example of the, the music sales. So uh, they had people listen to a bunch of hooks from uh, music from unsigned artists on MySpace in around 2006 and uh, rate how much they liked those different songs. Uh, then they waited a few years and then looked at the music sales data uh, nationwide on how those songs uh, actually did. And brain activity in a part of the brain that we're going to be talking about uh, in a moment, part of the brain's reward pathway called the nucleus accumbens, predicted uh, how well those songs would do at a population level. But the people's conscious ratings of how much they liked those songs were not predictive of how the population was responding. So this offers special insight in instances when self-report might not be that reliable. Uh, which leads us to our first study. So how do we value the environment? How do we put a price on nature? And this is a very contentious uh, question uh, because a lot of the time, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, you know, moral and economic trade-offs when we're trying to ask people to assign dollar values to those natural resources. Environmental economists use uh, surveys called contingent valuation surveys to try to elicit this essentially asking people their willingness to pay to protect or restore a uh, natural resource that's under threat. They first used this most prominently uh, in the, after the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill. But there's a number of problems with uh, contingent valuation. One is incentive compatibility. So people don't actually pay uh, what they're saying they're willing to pay. It's just a hypothetical question. And so they can throw out any number. And then a lot of people uh, give protest zeros. So they say something to the effect of, you can't put a price on that. It's invaluable. And they refuse to answer. And this can be, uh, depending on the study, anywhere from 30 to 50% of the responses that they receive. And these are summarily thrown out before analysis. And this is a problem because you're throwing out uh, a lot of the, uh, probably the people that value nature mo the most. right? They just can't assign a dollar value. So this is an instance where self-report is not that uh, reliable and brain data might offer some insight. The third point that I, I want to make that environmental economists noted when they were doing these uh, surveys was that people really seemed to be queuing to uh, the land use that was happening uh, that was hurting that environment. So being overly focused on something like how they felt about the oil spill uh, rather than the place that was compromised. And so they were basing their willingness to pay on not on the natural resource itself, but on the circumstances that happened to it. Uh, this led uh, Daniel Kahneman to comment on this and call it an example of affective emotion or affective valuation. For our purposes today, um, affect we can think of as as emotion. Uh, so he was saying, you know, this captures attitude expressions, but not people's actual economic preferences. So this motivated us to ask: Can we see the role of emotion in environmental valuation in the brain? Do these destructive actions of these third parties? actually matter more than the natural resource itself in determining this willingness to pay? And can we predict behavior using brain uh, data? Can we do better? Can we provide a complementary method uh, that offers some new insight into these outstanding questions? So we did a behavioral survey before this that the um, results are the same as in the neuroimaging. I'm going to focus on the neuroimaging study. Uh, 20 subjects were endowed with $24 each. Uh, they saw a series of 24 different parks and uh, proposed land uses. Uh, we had gotten a separate sample of people to rate these parks in terms of how iconic or archetypal they thought uh, those parks were and the, rate the land uses on how destructive uh, they thought those land uses were. And they saw a series of 72 different trials like this where we asked them, do you want to donate to protect this park from this proposed new land use that's going to take uh, a quarter of the, of the land. And if we, p we picked one trial to randomly uh, count for real. And if people donated uh, on that trial, then we took the money out of their endowment 
and gave it to their choice of the California State Parks Foundation or the National Parks. Uh, we, we wanted to use parks in this instance because at the time that we started the study, uh, the California State Parks were under a lot of pressure. There was a budgetary crisis where over a quarter of the parks were scheduled for closure. Uh, this is one of the hit you over the head examples of what people would see when they're in the scanner. Uh, basically, they see a, a place like Yosemite. Uh, they see a proposed land use for a quarter of that uh, park. And then they see uh, the amount that we're asking them to donate uh, out of their endowment. And they can uh, choose yes or no. So what actually happened in the brain? Uh, to understand that, we're briefly going to go over how psychologists and, and neuroscientists think about uh, emotion. And so the way they think about affect, a lot of times it's commonly mapped on this two-dimensional axis. Uh, one axis is valence, so how positive or negative uh, the emotions that you're feeling are. And the other is arousal, how strongly uh, you're feeling those emotions. And relevant to brain imaging, we're going to really focus on uh, positive arousal, so strong positive emotions, and negative arousal being strong negative emotions. And these are associated with approach behaviors, things that you want to obtain. Uh, or avoidance behavior is things that you want to get away from, uh, respectively. And through meta-analyses and a lot of different studies, we, we know uh, generally where these uh, take place in the brain, where they're represented best. Uh, for the positive arousal, we look to an area of the brain called the striatum, uh, particularly a subregion called the nucleus accumbens. Uh, it's there in kind of that uh, yellow color. And uh, for negative arousal, we look at the anterior insula, which is represented there uh, in blue, and we'll loop back to those in just a moment. Um, this affective information is integrated uh, in a part of the brain that also handles you know, how you uh, form value calculations uh, and, and calculate subjective value, and that's in the MPFC, which is in this kind of region up front here. So what happened when people saw iconic parks? It elevated activity in this uh, positive arousal region, uh, particularly the nucleus accumbens. Um, it's an area that's often predictive of behavior, and in charitable giving studies, uh, it's often associated with that warm glow of giving that people use, uh, feel when, they, when they're donating, when they're helping people out. Uh, the striatum's at the core of the brain's reward pathway, uh, so-called because it responds to all the good things in life. Uh, you know, it'll respond to food, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Uh, all that stuff falls into uh, how the striatum uh, is responding. And so, uh, the important part here, though, is that unlike a lot of other charitable giving studies, nucleus accumbens was not predictive uh, of behavior uh, in, the, in this study. What was predictive of behavior was actually uh, negative arousal response. So what happened when people saw uh, destructive land uses? Uh, so people donated significantly more often if they saw destructive land use, and they also do donated significantly more often if they saw even a conservative use in a park that they felt was iconic. And this was associated with the amount of negative arousal people were feeling. And negative arousal was mediating the relationship between people's destructive land use uh, impacting uh, their donation behavior. So all, all of the, uh, the bar graphs that you see today, the error bars are going to be standard error measurements. Um, what, what was associated with this was we also saw more anterior insula activity uh, when people were seeing these destructive land uses. And this is an area that responds to both physiologically and morally aversive stimuli. And uh, this positively predicted do decision to donate. So the more anterior insula activity that people had, uh, the more likely they were to donate to protect the parks. Uh, <coughs> moreover, we saw an individual difference. When we looked at, uh, we took ratings of everybody's pro-environmental attitudes using uh, Dun Dunlap's revised uh, NEP scale. And so people who were more pro-environmental actually had much stronger anterior insula activation when they saw these uh, destructive land uses. And uh, this was actually the only difference uh, that we saw uh, between the brains of people who were more or less pro-environmental. When people were integrating this information, viewing the scenario as a whole, this was associated uh, with activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. So calculating subjective value also considers uh, self-relevant information as opposed to information relevant to others a lot, uh, evaluates trade-offs. And this, this uh, activity actually predicted withholding donation for yourself. Um, so it may have been that the MPFC was more active uh, when people were 
calculating that they had high value for the amount of money they would keep uh, if they didn't donate. So this is a logistic regression that basically just sums up uh, what we were talking about in terms of the response to the anterior insula and medial prefrontal cortex and the impact on uh, donations. We're going to be seeing more of these a little bit later on. Basically, we do these uh, series of, of models where at first we just model the attributes of the uh, you know, behavioral stimuli uh, and their role, and then the brain regions, and then the combination of both. So what did we learn? Uh, environmental economists were right. Uh, people were responding to land use and not to the resource itself. Uh, using cost-benefit assessment regions of the brain may predispose individuals to more selfish behavior, and this can be overridden by emotional responses. Now, this can be a takeaway for uh, nonprofits and NGOs uh, that maybe you don't want to throw vast amounts of data at people and get them into a cost-benefit analysis frame of mind uh, when they're thinking about environmental uh, decisions. If you want them to act, it may be better to leverage uh, the emotions. And uh, most importantly for the next studies that we're going to talk about is that pro-environmental attitudes can translate into these visible differences in activity in brain regions that predict behavior. And this is a very uh, positive uh, finding for things like environmental education where, you know, if you can get people's attitudes to change, you can even perceptibly uh, visualize the impact of that attitude change uh, in the brain and how it uh, plays out in behavior. So we'll be moving on now to uh, talking about energy efficiency decisions, uh, going through a uh, national, national uh, survey that we did. Uh, this was in partnership with a colleague in the ms &E department, uh, Ansu and Sahu. And uh, we're looking at basically people's uh, purchasing behavior around refrigerators and light bulbs. So residential energy usage accounts for about 20% of US energy consumption. Uh, and in an effort to make people a little bit more efficient, you know, the EPA made the Energy Star certification program to kind of draw attention to goods that were energy efficient via an eco-label. Uh, but there was a problem with this uh, that was found by an energy economist that used to be here at Stanford, uh, Sebastian Hood, and he was looking at real world market data in people's purchases of refrigerators and found that there, there was a subset of people, about 25% of individuals, who seemed like they were making a binary decision on energy efficiency based on the presence or absence of the label. And the problem with this was uh, there's such a wide range of efficiencies that are captured by the Energy Star label that uh, a lot of people might have been underinvesting in energy efficiency compared to if the label wasn't there uh, and we, we might have actually been creating some inefficiency. So we utilize eco-labeling in, in the hopes that for people who are able to and willing to parse uh, complex concrete uh, energy consumption data, uh, they're actually going to focus on that data more when they see the label. And for people who don't have that desire or that capacity uh, to go through the numbers, that it'll act as an informational substitute. So this kind of motivated us to look at, you know, in what types of individuals might the Energy Star label actually be backfiring? Who might be over or under investing in energy e efficiency independent of the label, and who's most influenced uh, by the Energy Star uh, label. So we did a nationwide survey of 1,550 households. Uh, everyone had purchased or remodeled their home in the last five years. And uh, we asked them a series of, of, of uh, stated choice tasks you'll see in a minute. Uh, we elicited consumer decisions on fridges and bulbs, specifically compact fluorescent uh, light bulbs. And so here's an example of what people saw when they were making uh, decisions on light bulbs. We had four factors for bulbs. We had six for uh, fridges, but we were mainly concerned with uh, presence or absence of the Energy Star label, the uh, energy consumption of the product, and the price, and the trade-offs that people made uh, between those uh, three attributes. And people basically just chose between uh, three uh, items, and they did this uh, 10 times for each. Uh, product category. We also gave them a number of different questionnaires uh, to capture the kitchen sink, everything from demographics to financial history to time preferences, uh, environmental attitudes. Uh, we gave them math tests uh, to capture how, how good they were at math. And uh, personality traits, uh, 
they, they loved us by the time that they were done with this questionnaire, I'm sure. Um, and so I'll give you an example of how we elicited people's discount rates, for instance. It was just 21 questions that were variations on, uh, you know, would you prefer $30 tonight or $35 in 20 days? And that gave us a ability to calculate how steeply somebody discounts the value of money uh, through time. So we started assessing you know, how large is the gap uh, between a rational benchmark of how people should value energy efficiency uh, and the actual, uh, say, actual decisions that people were making. So who were undervaluing or overvaluing energy efficiency? And the benchmark was an economically rational benchmark of basically what's the break-even point? Are you willing to pay enough um, that, uh, for a reduction in energy cost that it's, it breaks even with the amount that that would have uh, cost you over the lifetime of that product? And we gave people uh, the average lifespan of the bulb and the cost per kilowatt hour extended and all of those different things so that if they were economically rational actors, they could calculate uh, this in its entirety. And of course, um, given like, no, no one is actually going to do this uh, in the way that they operate. Um, but economists would think that they, they might. So, <laughs> so we're focusing on, on results. Uh, we were able to calculate models in two different ways. One, using a standard 6% uh, discount rate for everyone. Or we could tailor it to the individual and use their own discount rate. And we're only going to talk about results that were significant in both models. Uh, remain significant after a bond for owner correction. We had so many different variables in this that we had to account for 16 hypotheses. Um, and things that were significant in models that both included and excluded environmental externalities. So the cost uh, you know, per person uh, of the environmental harm that was happening um, just by, by using these appliances. And you know, we get, up, get tables like this, which I'm not going to belabor you with, but we're just going to run through the take home messages, which is uh, highly pro-environmental people overvalued savings on energy consumption. Now, I put that in quotes because we're not capturing the warm glow that they might be feeling uh, by buying uh, pro-environmental things or the, the social gain that they think they might get if people see that they have an Energy Star label on, on the fridge that they've, they got in their house. Or, uh, any of those things. Um, the surprising thing was that highly numerate people systematically undervalued savings on energy consumption. And we're going to revisit that in a minute because this was just looking at who's undervaluing and overvaluing, not the magnitude of how far off they are from rationality. If you look at who's closest to rationality and uh, what accounts for that disparity, then we actually see, uh, again, people that are way far off from rationality are the people who are good at math. Um, the people who are more rational are, in general, women, uh, higher household income, and have a graduate, in, uh, graduate degree. So why the highly numerate? So there, there's some examples where people who are good at math uh, can pick a worse option when that, that option includes more numeric content. So it basically makes it more attractive to them, uh, and they put greater weight on it. So they may extract more emotional content from numbers. And this may also make them more price sensitive, which would reduce willingness to pay across all the different attributes. They might become penny wise and pound foolish. So I've been doing a study, uh, which I'm still analyzing the results from, that follows up on this, where we ask a bunch of, of, of thrift, penny wise, pound foolish questions. And also, I try to disrupt people's uh, mathematical abilities while they're doing the state of choice task uh, in, an, in an effort to try to see whether being good at math is just highly correlated with a personality trait uh, that makes you thrifty, or whether it's actually some, some role of, of numeracy itself. So we can see the effect uh, of the label on people's valuation. Uh, to break this down, basically everyone on the bottom row uh, increases their willingness to pay for energy efficiency if the label is present. Everyone on the top row is decreasing in reaction, uh, and people on the left started out in a place where they were already overvaluing energy efficiency, people on the right where they were undervaluing. And people that are in group D are basically, uh, it's mostly people that are pro-environmental, uh, have very strong pro-environmental attitudes, and basically they just become um, overshooting more and more in how they value uh, energy efficiency. But we're also helping a lot of people uh, who started out in a place of undervaluation to be more uh, rational through the use of the Energy Star. 
And you might think that people who are good at math don't necessarily, uh, you know, w wouldn't respond as well to something like a label, which isn't full of concrete information. But uh, you can see that actually it worked better on people who were good at math in terms of bringing their valuation up uh, than it did for the general, general populace. So that kind of uh, sets the stage for the, the neuroimaging that we did. And what we wanted to ask is, what are the neural and product attribute driven mechanisms that might be motivating people's purchasing choices? And how does this differ uh, in people who have high or low pro-environmental attitudes or math skills? Because we know that's uh, you know, relevant for these under and overvaluation. Uh, and do the discount rates uh, also play, play a role in how people think? So we gave uh, 36 people uh, $10 that we endowed them with. Uh, again, another incentive compatible task where uh, they were buying uh, CFLs uh, while we were scanning their brains, which I'm sure was riveting because we gave them 64 <laughs> to go through. Um, and they also did the full nationwide state of choice survey and, and questionnaires. And we discounted the CFLs 75% uh, uh, while we were basically trying to promote giving and this elicited an, an uh, uh, trying try to promote purchasing. So this elicited a, a purchase rate of about 38%. Uh, we wanted to have enough data to, to analyze, essentially. And people uh, essentially saw this information presented piecemeal. Uh, every four seconds, we would add a new attribute. So first, they saw the light bulb. Then energy star label or not, we had a dark blue box if it wasn't there. Um, the annual energy cost to them and then the price, and then they were able to pick yes or no whether or not they wanted uh, to buy it. And just to refresh on uh, brain areas really quickly, uh, we're gonna be focusing again on these affective systems for positive arousal, we're looking in the striatum, uh, particularly the nucleus accumbens. For negative arousal, we're looking at the anterior insula, and for integrating information, we're looking at the MPFC. Uh, we're gonna add one more region uh, it's a little hard to see here the distinction between the red and pink, but pink is nucleus accumbens, and then slightly above there is the caudate. Uh, for our purposes today, we can think of it still as you know, part of that reward pathway, as part of the striatum, um, still associated with positive arousal. It's a little bit more on the side of uh, action planning than, than calculating reward magnitude and that sort of thing, uh, but very t closely tied uh, in operation to the, the nucleus accumbens. So what predicted purchasing? Uh, both the areas of the striatum, the caudate and the nucleus accumbens, positively predicted that people would buy these bulbs. Each responded positively to lower prices, but also to the presence of the energy star label. Um, nucleus accumbens was significantly uh, more active when the label was there versus not. And there was also a marginal difference uh, between conditions when, when it was, the label was there or not, if the price uh, was high versus low and it favored a lower price. For the caudate, uh, very similar, uh, more significant difference between uh, the label being there or not, uh, and also a significant difference when the label wasn't there between low and high prices. We also saw activity in the MPFC, again, subjective value calculation, and this was correlating with people considering the interactions between price and the label, and also between all three product attributes. Uh, it's very, very common in, in purchasing studies, integrating information uh, for this activity to correlate with, with buying. But uh, as we saw, similar to the, the other study, the MPFC activation was actually associated with fewer CFL purchases. And what this might mean is because it's evaluating trade-offs uh, in this region, the more difficult trade-offs may require more horsepower, but ultimately uh, not elicit uh, purchases when people are on the fence. And uh, we'll see also that it's uh, really related to individual differences in a moment. Uh, this is just a different way of looking kind of at the trends between uh, brain activity and purchasing behavior. Every one of these dots is a uh, different item that they saw, a different CFL bulb. Uh, on the y-axis, we're seeing the probability that that item was purchased across the group. Uh, and on the x-axis, for the different regions, we're seeing you know, how active was that average brain activity uh, at the time that people were making the decision. And we see, you know, the areas associated with positive emotions, 
uh, you know, are positively associated with buying, negative emotions negatively associated, but also cost benefit assessment is negatively associated with buying. Uh, again, just a logistic regression to kind of summarize that we've got nucleus accumbens and the MPFC uh, working at odds with each other. Uh, nucleus accumbens and caudate track together, so I, I took caudate out of this, but if we put caudate in, then caudate plays the same role as, as the nucleus accumbens in these models. So what about um, actually looking at and breaking down individual differences? Let's look at pro-environmental attitudes first. Uh, there's differential response in the caudate uh, based on the interactions of price and the energy star label uh, based on people's uh, pro-environmental concern. And the way that breaks down, um, now this is, a, this is bar graphs where we're basically sampling out of the entire caudate on both sides. And if we look there, it's a very uh, specific uh, subregion sub that, that is different between these two. So, it's not going to look as, as profound in this, but what we can get out of this is basically the people who are low in their pro-environmental concern are responding in the reward pathway uh, most to the price differential and only look at uh, energy star label, only react to the energy star label when they're differentiating between uh, high-priced items. And in people that have high pro-environmental concern, uh, they're focusing a lot more equally on the energy star and uh, price. For people uh, looking at people's numeracy, uh, it was a little bit harder to distinguish uh, numeracy effects because everybody in Silicon Valley is really good at math. Uh, so you can see on the, uh, the top is basically our histogram of, of people's scores, the distribution of scores out of 15 uh, for the national sample. Uh, and then at the bottom, it's our local sample of people in Palo Alto. Uh, <laughs> and we, we had one person, basically, who was under the mean for the national sample. Um, and, and the range was a lot less. So uh, standard deviation was reduced. It hurts our ability to, to really take apart um, that. We, do, we didn't pick up the, the willingness to pay uh, for energy consumption being different in this sample. However. Uh, numeracy overall was uh, significant in people not buying. So this plays into that uh, thrifty uh, mechanism that we were talking about earlier. People that are good at math uh, are just less likely to, to buy. And this might be uh, you know, that affect towards numbers. And we actually do see that the caudate is more active uh, in these more numerate individuals when they see low prices. So instead of a, a pain of paying idea, it might be that they're just, they get a reward signal out of uh, getting a good deal. The, uh, there's also like a, a lot of nuance in how the affective systems in people who are highly numerate uh, respond to energy costs. So uh, while they behave similarly uh, across everyone uh, in the caudate, uh when they're looking at high energy costs, the CADE is responding a lot uh, more to low energy costs in people who are good at math. Uh, the people that are bad at math are really responding based on price differential. In the insula, where we're dealing with negative arousal, uh, you actually get a polarizing effect for high annual energy costs. Uh, so people who are bad at math when they see high annual energy costs, the insula goes uh, way up. When people who are good at math see them, it's tamped down. Okay? And this might be we're looking at brain activity when uh, people have already seen the energy cost and then they see the price. So they might have already decided it's, if it's a high annual energy cost item that they're not going to buy it and thus they're, they've stopped evaluating it basically and maybe affect is, is playing less of a role because their attention is elsewhere. But basically numeracy is re related to this differential affective response, uh, and there's some symmetry in the way the positive and negative systems are looking at, at energy cost. The last thing we want to look at is uh, discount rates, and we're incorporating discount rates because it's well studied uh, in neuroeconomics. We know where to look for how people trade off, uh, you know, reward magnitudes that are immediate and, and uh, long-term gains, that sort of thing. And there may be some parallels between how people trade off the short-term and long-term rewards and trade off upfront cost and uh, you know, annual operating cost. 
So energy economists uh, also often attribute that underinvestment in energy, tech, energy efficiency to these high, uh, people having high discount rates. So this, this is what motivated us to look at this. And we actually do find that people with high discount rates, when they see the energy star label, when that first appears to them, they have a very different response. All the affective systems in the MPFC uh, are, have, have an elevated response in people who have high discounting. Now, here's the really crazy thing uh, that we found, which is really that discount rates actually capture such different modes of thinking about these trade-offs that different brain regions predict behavior depending on your discount rate. So people that are high discounters uh, actually have significantly more uh, activation when uh, in, in these uh, affective systems. So the, these, these regions are actually uh, predicting uh, purchasing behavior uh, more accurately in them. Uh, the nucleus accumbens is driving purchasing and the anterior insula is, is uh, making them not, not buy. Uh, however, for people who are low discounters, uh, they're actually using uh, just the MPFC and that is driving down their decision to donate. So it's really two different processing styles um, being emotional or rational about uh, parsing this information. You can also see that uh, in general there's uh, more significant uh, z-scores on the interaction terms for people that have low discounting. Um, so they're integrating information more deeply. They're considering uh, those interactions and those trade-offs uh, a lot more. Uh, as, as would make sense if they uh, are relying more on the MPSC to make those decisions. So uh, though high and low discounters are using different mental machinery, they do converge on similar behaviors. The buy rates are about the same uh, for both groups. Um, but this gives us some indication of knowing how, we can know how to provide environmental messaging to create the, the biggest impact um, because we know uh, which systems are being leveraged in which groups, and if we want to focus, say, more on high discounters, uh, you know, we know that things like the label uh, are working on uh, their reward pathways, and they're using those to, to make decisions more readily, uh, and so we can kind of hand tailor these things. So what did we learn uh, overall on this? The reward pathway in the individuals with low environmental concern uh, primarily responds to favorable pricing, while people that really care about the environment, are giving more equal weight to the Energy Star label being there and the price. Uh, high numeracy gives rise to differential emotional responses to price and operating costs. Uh, and individuals with high discount rates respond more emotionally to the Energy Star label and are driven more strongly by those emotional systems during processing. So future directions that I want to head are understanding this un undervaluation effect uh, in high numeracy figuring out whether it's correlated with numeracy or it's actually um, part of numeracy itself, and uh, whether it's related to uh, people being thrifty overall and just buying less or to the actual uh, energy efficiency. And then looking a little bit deeper at the relationship between temporal discounting um, and these trade-offs in price versus operating costs. Ultimately, I'd like to predict real-world market data in these energy efficient appliance purchasing behavior. Uh, using the brain response uh, during fMRI. And going back to environmental philanthropy, uh, I'm hoping to work with Nature Conservancy in the coming months uh, to do a similar uh, population level prediction uh, study where we use real world uh, conservation campaigns uh, that they're carrying out for different, uh, different areas and show them to people in the magnet, get their, their responses and see if the, the brain responses say the nucleus accumbens can actually predict which, uh, which ones get funded and how, how well they get funded. And uh, I, I'd really like to kind of keep working on trying to obtain a value signal from the brain which complements these contingent valuation methods. Because we found that you know, people weren't focusing on the resource itself for making those decisions, um, but if we can elicit some kind of value signal that's associated with uh, the resource that would be uh, really powerful complement to, to contingent valuation to kind of shore up all those opt-out responses, those protest zeros that we're seeing. And uh, I'd also like to look at you know, how sense of place and environmental education can translate into this visible brain activity that we see uh, based on people being more pro-environmental uh, and then downstream of that, how that influences pro-environmental behavior. 
So these are the first steps in environmental neuroeconomics. Um, I think since we're, we've started showing that th these methods do provide some insights, insights that you can't get uh, anywhere else, especially, the, for example, the, the discounting uh, is a good example of that where people are converging on similar behavior, uh, but they're using very different uh, neural mechanisms to get there, uh, which you can leverage in different ways and different people. Um, I, I think more people are going to be uh, you know, working in, in this field. We've gotten a lot of uh, attention all, and a lot of interest uh, all across the country, and I'm hearing about more and more uh, people wanting to, to work on applying neuroscience to, to, to uh, environmental issues. Uh, we want to find some new applications for this and try to prove that these insights in the brain translate to uh, the broader population, that you can scale these studies so that the, you, know, you can actually predict the, that population level behavior. And then harnessing the insights that we find, especially with regards to individual differences, to kind of create better tailored policies, figure out ways to, to optimize uh, across all these different groups of people, different groups of, of, of thinking uh, to try to combat climate change and uh, get a better, better world for all of us. So, yeah, thanks everyone. Do we want to do questions or acknowledgements? Yeah. Um, so thanks for your talk, Nick. That was really great. Uh, one of the things I'm wondering about is, um, can you look at, or do people ever look at uh, different demographics of the of the people that you're that you're um, neuroimaging to see if those things are also playing into <laughs> their emotional response and their propensity to give to uh, environmental cause, that sort of thing, like race or economics? Yeah, so there's some like cultural neuroscience stuff that's started uh, now where it's viewing differences between uh, different ethnicities and that sort of thing in terms of how they, they respond to everything from like, you know, even how they react to different types of smiles and that kind of thing. Uh, not a lot, I mean, there's, there's really nothing, there's hardly anything on environment at large uh, in neuroscience right now. Um, but age is a tricky one to get at um, because the older people get, the more idiosyncratic their brain <laughs> is laid out like. Uh, and so when you're trying to average everyone's brains together, um, it's, it's a little more dodgy and you're having to warp it more uh, if they're older. Um, so, so we kind of we kind of limit it to like you know 40s and under, right? Um, which is which is bad, um, <laughs> unless we're explicitly studying age, in which case you account for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Nick. Amazing research. Um, you mentioned sense of place yeah. and the willingness to pay. I was wondering what you know at this point about that um, that property, which is really interesting for people that study the allocation of conservation funding to purchase land for conservation, for instance. There's research that shows that there's a difference between what would be optimal for threatened species and where money is actually allocated. Right. So what, for example, in your study of the parks, were people more interested in the parks that were closed? Yeah, so there was, there was like a, a very high correlation between what they thought was iconic and what they thought was familiar and had visited. Um, for obvious reasons, if you've got like a few standout parks, people are more likely to visit them. But one of the interesting things was you got not only this um, reward pathway activation being stronger for iconic parks, but also um, in a part of the brain that encodes spatial landscapes. Uh, so that was more vibrantly active when people found it more iconic. And I also looked at uh, just the familiarity score that people had for that place uh, as opposed to iconicness. And that had basically the, the same uh, results. So I think looking at the interplay between the reward pathway and parts of the brain that encode spatial landscapes is, is where to look for sense of place and where I, where I would start looking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you done any, any kind of studies where you're kind of camping what the contributions are and you're not having camping so you actually have to yourself? Not yet. I, yeah, to-do list. <laughs> That would give you a clear understanding how you can make policy changes to 
yeah, so the, it's like a, a few steps out. It's basically, you know, try to do it in the lab, try to do it uh, at the, to predict population level, and then start intervening, right, and ma making interventions based on that and see if you can modify the policy. Yeah. yeah Fran? I mean, I always work, I, first of all, thanks so much for your presentation, but something I always wonder whether you can evaluation questions, is how this problem of, of collective action. So you're kind of being asked, you want to give kind of $10 to save the whales or something, right? But, but saving the whales can do with 10 or my $10, it's going to depend on what, what everyone else does. Um, and I think, you know, the same thing is with the way the questions in your talk study. So I'm, I'm wondering, how do you think this comes into, uh, you know, what you see in the brain and, yeah. and how are people doing that calculation? Yeah, so I think, um, so that comes back to like environmental locus of control and how, how much self-efficacy you feel you have to impact something with your contribution. Uh, we did like basically tell people beforehand, you know, your contribution is in concert with the contributions of a lot of other people. It's not like standalone, don't think $18 is gonna save, you know, the, this park, right? Um, so we made that very clear to people to try to put them in a frame that they're part of a collective. Um, and they did have, uh, there were, social cognition and theory of mind regions were online when they were doing this stuff. Uh, but I, I think the MPFC activation that's telling you to keep the money for yourself, I think that's actually people probably doing the weighting and figuring out like, it's $15, it's not gonna do anything, you know. And, and the more they think about that, the more likely they are to perseverate on that, on that given trial, the less likely they are to actually act, right? So overthinking it and talking yourself out of, out of it, yeah. yeah. So, I, great presentation, thank you very much. So the question I have is, how long do you expose the subjects in the FNMR to the scenarios? Uh, they're pretty fast scenarios, because you don't want to like, uh, you're averaging the, the activation over the course of like when they saw that time period, right? So you don't want to give them like, 10 seconds, read a paragraph or something like that. Uh, the trials on average, you know, you're feeding them a new piece of information every four seconds. And so the, the whole trial, maybe 15 to 22 seconds uh, for the, that range. And then you're, you're doing anywhere from 40 to 75 trials, depending on the thing. I think it's time for one more question. Yeah. I, I also just wanted to thank my uh, committee. Uh, so Brian, you've been carrying me through all this and teaching me all, all the neuroeconomics uh, behind uh, being able to pull, pull this off. Uh, and Nicole, you've been so great at, at teaching me how to do uh, think about environmental behavior from not just the psychology perspective, but uh, a wider one. And uh, Robert, you've, you've helped me through, uh, probably going on 10 years now from undergrad, uh, just figuring out how to navigate uh, academia and public talks and all that fun stuff. Uh, and, and Ursula, you've been really insightful for, for environmental risk perception studies, which I wasn't able to talk about uh, today, but uh, is something I'm gonna be working on uh, in the in the coming months, and it's something I, I teach heavily out of when I, I, I teach my my own class. And and Paul, thanks for stepping up to to be the chair and uh, all the classes on judgment and decision making I took from you over the years. <laughs> uh, a couple more, and then <laughs> I'll let you guys go. Um, really wanted to thank my my parents. Uh, I, I've had a lot of help to get here from everyone, obviously, um, but. I've had over 80 broken bones in the course of my life, so they've, they've helped me through uh, a lot of uh, rough stuff. And I uh, really wanted to thank also uh, my colleague on the Energy Star work, uh, Ansu Sahu. Uh, it was a really uh, productive collaboration, and he really shored up the econometric side uh, of, the, of the methodology and, and the work. Uh, the EIPER community, uh, everyone in, in my cohort, my fellow PhD students and the staff, um, faculty from uh, pre-court and from, from IPER and even from my, my undergrad, uh, everyone at uh, Brian's uh, SPAN lab, uh, especially all of the lab managers through the years have helped me a lot with data analysis. Um, 
And then uh, there have been a lot of, of different groups, Woods Institute, Rising Environmental Leaders Program, the Center for on Philanthropy and Civil Society, the Haas Center, and the Center for Ethics and Society have all um, given me different communities to talk about this work with, uh, different perspectives, uh, and, and people to, to bounce ideas off of that gives me a much different view on especially the moral and ethical implications of uh, this envir these environmental issues that we're studying. Uh, the Precord Energy Efficiency Center uh, funded a lot of the research that I've done uh, and uh, actually is, is helping me uh, do a postdoc uh, after this. And then I had uh, a lot of great research assistants too, uh, helping with uh, the nuts and bolts of things. So thanks everybody.